So hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the last event of the BUL International Law Group on children, the justice system and international law. And along these lines, this current event is chaired and waged by Dr. Louise Ford from Brunel University, London. She is going to give an introduction of the excellent speakers we have for today. And for my part, just to tell you that uh, your support has been very much crucial all over the year in all the events that the BUL International Law Group waged. We thank you very much. We promise to return next year with more events and interesting discussions. And to remind you that this event is being recorded and the recording as always appears in the Brunel Law School YouTube channel. So you can subscribe also there in order to keep a pace of our events. With this and with no further delays, the podium is passed to Dr. Ford, who is going to make the relevant introductions and wage the discussion. Dr. Ford. Thank you. Um, so thank you all um, very much for coming to our research panel today to discuss the impact of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in bringing about change for children in youth justice systems. And we're very honored today to be joined by um, international experts in children's rights law and in the child justice system, um, including Professor Anne Skelton, Professor Ursula Kilkelly, Dr. Nessa Lynch and Dr. Yannick van den Brink. Um, and together, they're going to be discussing a range of issues relating to um, bringing UNCRC principles to bear in practice in the child justice system. So issues related to strategic lit litigation, the development of principled approaches to responding to children who commit serious offences, and developing innovative approaches to practice in relation to de detention based on these children's rights standards. So we are going to have three separate presentations um, um, today. And after that, we will have time for discussion um, of, of all three presentations um, together. In the meantime, please feel free to put any questions you might have in the chat box um, and we will address those towards the end. Our first speaker today is Professor Anne Skelton. Professor Skelton is Professor of Law at the University of Pretoria. She has worked as a children's rights lawyer in South Africa for 30 years and her global influence has been recognized through the, children, through the Juvenile Justice Without Borders Award in 2017. Her involvement as chairperson of the advisory board of the UN, UN Global Study on Children Deprived of Their Liberty and being appointed as an ambassador for the British Society of Criminology. Professor Skelton is currently a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, having been elected in 2020 for a second term of office. And her presentation today is entitled Access to Justice for the Enforcement of Children's Rights in Youth Justice. So thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, for that introduction. And greetings to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of this panel today. My presentation or my um, discussion is focused around access to justice for children. And I want to start by contextualizing that within South Africa, which is the country where I've had the most experience of trying to bring about access to justice for children in uh, child justice systems there. Um, but then towards the, the end of my presentation, I will move to uh, the international plane and talk a little bit about the optional protocol on communications procedure under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the kinds of cases that we have been receiving and would like to receive uh, in the future. And uh, we'll, I'll also mention what some of the other committees under the UN treaty body system um, um, you know, with the potential for using that for access to justice as well. So beginning then with the South African context, and you know, it's, it's always important to re reflect on um, the environment in which one works, because what, what is possible is often partially determined by the, the, the legal frameworks in the country where you are um, and the, the environment that enables using the convention in different ways. So, for example, we know that there are different models of incorporation um, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And there are systems where the convention is fully incorporated upon ratification. 
Um, I'm actually speaking to you from Scotland today, where I'm a, a visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde. And of course, Scotland is poised on the brink of um, um, bringing the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, into their system wholesale, so full incorporation. Um, so very interesting and exciting debates here. Now in South Africa, we actually did not go for a full incorporation model. We, we are basically um, a dualist system, which means that ratification doesn't automatically mean that the convention is binding immediately. However, the constitution does say that when considering a right in the Bill of Rights, the courts must consider international law and must prefer an interpretation that is in keeping with the, with the international law framing, which has the effect actually of, of almost creating um, a, a binding quality to those conventions um, as soon as the courts are seized with a matter where they have to consider international law. Uh, and, and, and indeed, um, what I've noticed about access to justice and the connection between the international law and access to justice at the domestic level is that it's almost a circular process whereby through using the international law at the domestic level, we in a sense incorporate it through those activities that we make it binding in our own systems by getting it cited by our courts. Um, thinking of courts as uh, that's what I'm going to be addressing today. Of course, there are many other ways to make the convention work, but I'm focusing on the role of, of the courts in access to justice and making the convention real. So in South Africa, we were fortunate in the 1990s, everything happened. We ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child and we drafted a new constitution. So that was a wonderful opportunity to actually embed uh, some of the um, convention's provisions into uh, our own constitution. And the most uh, clear example of that is the fact that in our final constitution, we included um, the, the principle that, uh, that when it comes to children, detention must be a measure of last resort um, and for the shortest appropriate period of time, and then in conditions that are appropriate to children, uh, an almost mirror image of Article 37B of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this embedding has been very important, and it's been used by law reformers and litigators since um, to very good effect, I would say. So I think it's important that we had the, the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child already there, uh, but only a few years earlier than when we drafted our constitution, which made for a more kind of seamless um, process of um, framing our laws within both a constitutional and international law um, environment. For the first decade, we were very busy doing law reform because that's what you do when you ratify a convention and when you make a new constitution, there's a flurry of lawmaking where everybody's trying to bring their laws in line. Um, and so that was, that was a, a good way to spend one's energy in those years was ensuring that we changed our laws as far as possible. But um, after a while, it became apparent that law reform doesn't do everything, that sometimes um, the promise between the law and what actually happens in practice uh, is a gap, and that uh, there, there need to be other means of holding the state accountable where they fail to fulfill on the promises of the Constitution and of the international instruments, either because they simply don't live up to the letter of the law, um, or sometimes because they actually pass new laws that go contrary to those uh, conventions. And so we had a number of uh, examples in South Africa where litigation was brought in order to, um, to ensure that the, the gains that we had made you know, were not falling back in any way um, and that we continued to push for the best possible interpretation of children's rights matters uh, through the courts. So one of the first of these was a case that was about minimum sentences. It was called Center for Child Law versus the Minister of Justice. And it was pushing back against a new law that the government had passed, 
which was um, linking serious crimes to uh, automatically long periods of imprisonment, from which it was possible to depart, but only in certain narrow circumstances. And the starting point was the longest possible sentence. So um, th this law was primarily aimed at adults, but 16 and 17 year olds got caught into it as well. So the, the lawmakers included 16 and 17 year olds. And the South African constitution was absolutely clear that 18 was the age um, of adulthood and therefore everyone below the age of 18 should be treated as children. So the, the case established that that law was unconstitutional insofar as it related to 16 and 17 year olds. And what was crucially important was that provision in our constitution, which was in itself derived from the Convention on Rights of the Child, that um, when it comes to children, detention must be a measure of last resort and for the shortest appropriate period of time. And the Minister of Justice's protestations that there was a discretion and that courts could go backwards even if they started with a long sentence was of no avail because the court said that that didn't help. That didn't help. You had to start with a clean slate if you were going to be true to the idea that detention is a last resort. You must start from zero and move forward and not start from 25 years and work backwards. Um, and so that was an important victory, but it was also an important victory because it helped to cement the idea that children are different from adults and that our sentencing processes must be different for them. Um, other important cases that we brought also focused around international law, another one was on arrest and at what moment does deprivation of liberty begin? Uh, and so we managed to at least get the courts to accept that um, arresting children required a very special consideration of their rights and that if there was any other way of dealing with them other than arresting them and taking them to the police station in a police van, that should be done. And that um, um, children's best interests have to be a constant presence in uh, processes relating to the arrest of children. And again, we were able to use perhaps slightly less powerfully, but nevertheless, we tried our best to, to use the Convention on the Rights of the Child in this case as well. And then there was a case uh, which related to um, a child, children being placed on, having their particulars placed on the sex offenders register as an automatic requirement upon conviction. Again, this law was primarily aimed at adults, but caught child offenders because they were not differentiated. And the law was attacked by the litigators on the basis that it uh, didn't sufficiently differentiate between adults and children. Um, and that it didn't allow for um, the principles of sentencing that are seen in, in broad international law, if you include the Beijing rules, for example, um, where we see that things like proportionality, individualization, reintegration, all of these principles um, are, are there in this judgment. And, and it indicated that you know, a system that doesn't allow an individualized approach to children by having an automatic rule of placement was not in line with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the right to participation at the sentencing stage was also cut across by that provision. Um, so Article 12 making an interesting um, showing in that case too. So uh, I think these are some good examples. Uh, uh, the, a more recent case that has been interesting is uh, the case relating to um, the anonymization of child offenders and child victims um, who are involved in criminal proceedings. And our law was somewhat ambigu ambiguous about whether those protections ended at the age of 18 or whether they continued beyond. And this was a complex case to argue in the children's rights framing, because of course, as soon as they turn 18, they're not children anymore. So can you talk about children's best interests when you're talking about an 18 year old? But, but if they committed the crime when they were 16 or 17, their way of approaching the defense and running their case would be different if they were facing the prospect um, of being named in shame should their trial go on too long and they turn 18 and therefore we were able to convince 
the Constitutional Court that the need for ongoing protection is framed within international law. It starts there, even though the protection must continue. If it is to be of any logic um, that it is there to protect children, it has to continue. And so we were we were able to, to get protection and anonymity protection for children um, going beyond the age of 18, located in international uh, principles as well as our constitution. So I think you can see then how access to justice pathways were built using international law. And as I said, um, there's a kind of circularity about this because with each one of these judgments, we're able to point to the previous judgment. We're able to point to how international law was used in those judgments. And so we build, we managed to build quite a strong international law framing, which is now absolutely binding, despite the fact that we have never fully incorporated the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So it also provides us with some interesting reflections about incorporation models and so on. And I know um, Ursula, who's on this panel as well, this is really her uh, area of expertise, but, but South Africa kind of stands out as being a strange example of a lack of full incorporation and yet at the same time quite a powerful incorporation through these actions that I've been talking about. I want to end by just talking about where these pathways at the, at the domestic level ultimately may lead. And here I want to mention the, um, the optional protocol on a communications procedure under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, by its very name, you can hear that it's optional, which is a pity because only 48 states have ratified it so far. Most of them are in Europe, but a huge number are also um, in South America. And um, the, uh, the, these are, um, this is a, a communications procedure under which complaints of rights violations can be brought against states. And um, of course, you can't come straight there without having attempted to exhaust your domestic re remedy. So again, there's a circularity um, between the international and the national level. And so the, 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 the pathways of access to justice must start on the ground, but can find their way um, all the way up. And um, we have not had many cases on youth justice issues. We've got one in the pipeline now, which is about the sentencing of somebody who is, and who is now uh, an adult in prison, but was sentenced at the time. So one of the committee things the committee is going to have to decide there is, you know, how and how uh, the rights of somebody who was a child at the time of sentencing continue and fall within the framing of the, the convention's protection, even after they've turned 18. Um, but I can say that I feel a little disappointed that we haven't seen more cases. So if any of you are thinking of you know, doing some litigation at the domestic level, think long-term, think long-haul. I do understand that many of you might be working in countries where uh, that haven't ratified the optional protocol. Um, but some of you are in Ireland, I know, and Ireland has, so that's good. Um, and some of you might be working with people in other countries that have. If not, don't give up though, because remember that other treaty bodies can also receive communications. Um, and um, several states, more states, for example, have ratified the, um, the, the communications procedure under the ICCPR, which is overseen by the Human Rights Committee, and of course the Convention Against Torture. Um, so the, the um, CAT committee also can receive communications. And of course, there's also very relevant bodies for anything relating to youth justice. Um, so I think the message that I want to leave you with is that the access to justice pathway is not a straight path, but a circular one. And that the work we do at the domestic level is very important. Um, incorporating international law, building it into our legal frameworks, on the ground, but not forgetting that there may be an avenue to go um, all the way to the international level in suitable cases. And I will end there and hand back to you, Louise. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't find the unmute button. Thank you very much for that um, really fascinating presentation. And I'm sure, um, you know, beginning with a lot of strands that will be picked up in our, um, our other discussions today. 
So again, we will take um, questions um, towards, towards the end and pick up on some of those strands. But for now, um, we are going to move to our second presentation, which comes from Dr. Nessa Lynch and Dr. Yannick Vandenbrink, um, who are going to consider how children's rights principles um, can have relevance and particular relevance to, develop, to developing, excuse me, to developing responses to serious offending by children. Um, Dr. Lynch and Dr. Vandenbrink have researched this topic um, widely, um, and I've recently published an edited collection with Routledge, which looks at this issue from a range of different perspectives. Dr. Lynch is an expert in youth justice and children's rights, um, particularly serious offending. Um, she has now left um, academia for a full-time um, role, but retains an association with the Faculty of Law, Victoria University of Wellington as a research fellow. And Dr. Vandenbrink is an associate professor of criminal law and criminal procedure at Free University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and a Rubicon research fellow at the University of Cambridge, the Institute the Institute of Criminology, United Kingdom. He publishes and teaches widely on themes related to youth justice, criminal justice, criminology and children's rights, and also serves as a deputy judge in the youth, just, in the youth court of the District Court of The Hague. So whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and the kind uh, introduction. Um, yeah, in this presentation, uh, Nessa and I are going to talk about responses to serious offending by children. Um, with serious offending, we mean uh, serious violent or sexual offences, so murder, manslaughter uh, or rape. Um, instances of children committing such serious offences are rare, but tend to spark massive public outcry and media coverage and can have system-wide implications. So the central question in this talk is what does a children's rights compliant response to serious offending look like? Uh, we tried to find answers to this question uh, based on an article that uh, Nessa and I wrote together, uh, which is titled Beyond the Life Sentence, which has been published in the International Journal of Children's Rights. Uh, in this article, we uh, review uh, responses in Anglo-Saxon common law jurisdictions and compare it to responses in European civil law jurisdictions. And we also based this uh, presentation on the book uh, that was just mentioned, uh, Responses to Serious Offending by Children, Principles, Practice and Global Perspectives, has, which has been published last month by Routledge, uh, was edited by Nessa, Louise and myself. And in this book, uh, scholars from various disciplines and jurisdictions across the globe reflect on responses to serious offending by children. Well, in the next, 15 minutes. Uh, I will first briefly uh, present the international uh, children's rights framework. Then NASA takes over and will explore the gap between principles and practice. She will explore um, uh, opportunities and barriers to reform and finally reflect on how to advance the research agenda. But first, briefly, the relevant uh, international children's rights framework, which was also touched upon in the previous presentation. Um, but this framework, uh, the, 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 the framework for children's rights compliant responses to serious offending um, is essentially built on articles 40 and 37 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the commentary uh, by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in general comment number 24. And in our book, in our paper, we argue that there are essentially four core underlying assumptions that uh, or pillars that underlie this a children's rights compliant approach. And that's first of all, humane treatment. Secondly, uh, child specific treatment. Thirdly, fair treatment. And fourthly, treatment aimed at reintegration. The first pillar, humane treatment, is um, grounded on the fundamental notion that children in conflict with the law are human beings with human rights uh, who should be treated with humanity and respect for the inherent dignity and worth. This implies a prohibition, a strict prohibition of torture and inhumane uh, or uh, cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment and punishment, as well as a prohibition of capital punishment and life sentences without the possibility of parole. The second pillar uh, boils down to the premise, and Anne mentioned that, that children are fundamentally different from adults and should be treated accordingly. Uh, from a children's rights perspective, children in youth justice are first of all perceived as lesser accountable. And some children below a certain age shouldn't be held accountable at all in the criminal justice system. So there should be a minimum age of criminal responsibility um, of at least 14, uh, according to the committee. Um, and those children who are above the minimum age 
the responses to serious offending uh, should be proportionate not only to the severity of the offense, but also to the degree of accountability or culpability. Children are also perceived as particularly vulnerable, so there should be additional protections in the youth justice system and in responses to serious offending. They are perceived as still in development, so the specific developmental needs of children should be um, addressed and met. And finally, they're, they're seen as rights holders with own views, with own opinions, who should be enabled to participate in the proceedings. So against this background, the CRC calls for the development of a child-specific youth justice system, which uh, uh, is appropriate to the age, needs, and evolving capacities of children. And the committee is very clear that also in very serious cases, children should, should not be tried and sentenced as adults. The third pillar, fair treatment, means that children are entitled to fair trial rights also when they're charged with very serious offenses. This means, amongst others, that they should be presumed innocent, receive legal assistance, and should be enabled to participate effectively in the proceedings. And particularly relevant in serious cases, which spark a lot of media attention, is the right to have their privacy respected. So in principle, uh, hearings should be held behind closed doors and the child's identity uh, should not be disclosed to the public. The fourth and final pillar is reintegration, which reflects the overarching objective of youth justice, which implies that responses to serious offending should promote the child's the sense of dignity and worth, uh, should reinforce the child's respect for the rights and freedoms of others, which basically implies uh, to prevent reoffending as well, uh, should take into account the child's age and should promote the child's reintegration to society, uh, making him or her uh, assume a constructive role in society. And this reintegration objective has several implication, it, implications. It ties in with this prohibition of excessive sentencing and like torture, inhuman degrading treatment, life sentences. Such sentences fundamentally oppose this reintegration objective of returning the child into society. It also limits the use of deprivation of liberty. So it basically supports or ties in with the principle that deprivation of liberty should be used only as a last resort and for the shortest appropriate period of time, um, and that non-custodial measures should be preferred where possible. If a child is deprived of liberty, child-appropriate regimes and detention conditions should prepare the child for a successful return into society. And finally, it ties in with the principle of proportionality, which in child justice does not only mean proportionate to the seriousness of the offense, but also proportionate to the circumstance and needs of the child. So the need for tailored interventions, tailored sentences. So these are the, the four fundamental pillars which we distinguish. Um, but it, when it comes to these very serious offenses, the question may arise, um, what about public uh, safety? Um, well, the committee in general comment number 24 um, takes the position that preserving public safety is a legitimate aim of youth justice. And it also um, highlights that deprivation of liberty of children may be accept uh, acceptable uh, if there is a serious risk for the safety of the public. At the same time, the committee is very clear that a strictly punitive approach is not in line with the convention and the committee takes the position that public safety is ultimately served best by a children's rights compliant approach. So that, that based on the idea that a children's rights compliant response aiming at reintegration into society ultimately serves both the interests of children as well as the interests of society. So this is basically the overarching children's rights framework uh, we, which we use as a starting point for developing a principled approach to responses to serious offending by children. In our article and book, we present a more specified and elaborate um, model, so to speak. But for now, I leave it with this and give the floor to Nessa. Thanks, Yannick, and um, thanks to the organizers for inviting us along today. Um, so I'm going to follow on from um, what Yannick has really set out the theoretical principles and talk a bit about um, some of the case studies from the ground um, and some of the challenges and then also give some edited highlights from the book project I think illustrate some of those themes. Um, so and work that I've done by myself and also the work in conjunction with Yannick so um, I've been really interested and we've been really interested on kind of how 
um, these responses or, or gaps um, work in on an individual state level. And so work that we've done together and separately on the common law jurisdictions and the European civil law jurisdictions really demonstrated some really prevalent themes and how states respond to those really high end, high tariff um, uh, serious cases. So and um, what we found from our studies before we engaged in this book project was inevitably um, the words that would come to mind when you're looking at the themes from state practice or um, exclusion. So generally, even in really tolerant youth justice systems, once a child or young person commits a really serious offence, they will be excluded from all or part of the protections of the youth justice system. And that really is a almost universal theme. And so part of my collaboration with Yannick was having become quite depressed on how the common law countries were doing. You know, I, I thought, you know, maybe there's some really good models elsewhere. And I suppose um, our extension of our study to the European civil law jurisdictions, the theme coming from that was about, um, I suppose, the law on paper versus the law on action, or um, as the young people would say, Instagram versus reality. So the um, European civil law jurisdictions uh, look a lot more tolerant, but when you actually delve into the practice, um, you can see that even though the responses are classed as something else, perhaps a welfare measure or a care and protection measure, the actual realities for the child or young person um, is the same, that they're probably spending a lot of time in detention. Um, so that was the result of that study. So some challenges and, and barriers for change that we identified was, I suppose, the criminological concept of penal populism, and um, that obviously these cases are very rare, but they tend to have a really catastrophic effect on society. So going back to cases that we'd be familiar with, like the Bulger case, um, there's been a couple of cases in New Zealand where I work, um, obviously the boy A, boy B in Ireland. Um, these are really shocking cases that um, really affect us. Um, you know, they, they really pick on so many themes um, across society. So often we see um, that it's very or it's much harder for the public to accept perhaps that these cases would be dealt with in a different way and so often i feel in the youth justice system we use these punitive um cases or sentences sorry as a backstop we say um look we have uh, diversionary tolerant responses for the majority of children but but you know don't worry because for the really serious cases we can still send children to prison so in a way it sometimes justifies measures that we take elsewhere in the system um, so in terms of, of work has been done, I think viewing the children's rights advocates field, um, so often we see much less concentration in advocacy materials um, and guidance around the serious end of the spectrum. So, you know, there's a reams of guidance on diversion and policing and um, other such measures, but often there's very little guidance on actually what age appropriate accountability looks like for these very serious offending. And um, so similarly, human rights bodies, and it might be interesting to hear Anne's perspective on this as well. Um, it's better in general comment number 24, definitely. But again, there's, there's some quite broad spectrum principles about public safety, um, but less specific material on actually what, what do those age appropriate accountability measures look like. And so similarly, academic research focuses a lot on the kind of critique of life imprisonment and juvenile death penalty but much less concentration on um, what you do instead. And uh, when I was a full-time academic, I used to also do a lot of policy and advocacy. And like, I've been in those rooms where politicians ask you, okay, you're saying I shouldn't have life imprisonment for children. So, you know, how, how do I deal with a 14 year old who's murdered somebody? What, what's your response? And you need to have that ready um, if you're gonna affect change. Um, so leading on to the book project, um, so uh, Yannick and I were joined by Louise and um, we have this idea of, again, trying to build on the work that Yannick and I had done and the work that Louise has done about children's rights um, in youth justice. And so we were looking to, I think, invite a real range of people from around the world, um, not just legal scholars, but people working in other fields, and to explore this idea of you know, what, what the current state is, but also what the future state could be. And so we're also really interested in this idea that in terms of reform that's happened, there are two major strands. And um, so there's a kind of quite US centric brain development neuroscience where um, change has been affected through a reliance on scientific principle. 
um, and evidence. And then we have the, the children's rights um, that Anne was just talking about in the South African context, um, which is based on this idea of principle that it's, it's right to treat uh, children as a separate class um, and not so much whether that individual child, their understanding or characteristics that we draw a line as a society. Uh, so we also aim to invite um, of our established scholars um, who, are, who are here today, but also um, to find people that were working in jurisdictions that maybe don't get so much exposure in the English language literature, um, and also to uh, build up some of our emerging scholars in the field. So, you know, there's so much in the book and it was actually great to go back to it this morning when I was preparing because um, we were deep in it for ages and then there's kind of that lag before it comes out. So it was actually cool to go back to it today and, um, you know, just think about what, what I would say. And some of some real edited highlights for me and if I leave anyone out, you know, it's not that um, it wasn't important. These are just some themes that really resonated for me. And um, so we aim to look at and the principal evidence and then the individual case studies. So um, in terms of the principle, I think some of the material that Yannick has talked about, like that real kind of gap uh, in the children's right field around that move from the principle, the broad principle to the implementation, what does that actually look like? Um, so in terms of the evidence, I think uh, some of our colleagues working in the psychology field that really resonated with me around um, that it's not just the age related development when you look at what who are the children who commit these kind of offenses it's also the real prevalence of um, neurodisability fetal alcohol syndrome and other um, neurodisabilities with traumatic brain injury that really have to then influence the type of responses that we have and um, because some of those children are not going to age out of those conditions and we have that responsibility um, to address their needs um, you know, so we had some great discussion as well about that developmental science lens. I described it as two different lenses in terms of developmental science and human rights, but also um, that we can see those as, as working together um, towards principled practice. Um, and so we also had contributions with looked at effectiveness and disproportionality. So again, a real characteristic of these children is uh, care experience and um, neurodisability, um, but also the prevalence around the world of, in my part of the world where I live, um, it's indigenous people, um, same in Australia. So in other countries, there are different uh, groups that are affected, but that disproportionality is a common theme. So we move then to the bulk of the book, which is about these individual jurisdictional case studies. And, you know, there's just such a fantastic range. And it was really great to have our colleagues from Iran and from China. Um, uh, which were two jurisdictions that I really knew nothing about and it was fantastic to engage with them and engage with those scholars but I suppose just to pick out one I think that has really resonated with me which was um, our colleagues from Ghana and um, so Emmanuel and um, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right so what day and Mabel Pinkran and I think what really resonated with me about their contribution was it was really moving away from and what I've described in one of my previous papers as rearranging vectors, which is so much of our responses to children who commit serious offences is about rearranging what we have now. Is say, let's have a shorter sentence of imprisonment and let's do some tweaks to the adult court procedure. But they really moved into that realm of actually reimagining what a response could look like. And so building on customary law in their jurisdiction and thinking about, um, I suppose, ways of addressing the really serious harm um, that allow people to tell their stories and um, allow the community to kind of absorb it and um, have some accountability but without actually being in that trial process so I think that was that real kind of pushing forward and actually reimagining what something different would look like. Um, so I suppose uh, drawing all those strands together towards uh, reform um, so the real themes, as we said, really built on the work that I had done and Yannick and I had done around those constant themes of exclusion, like even places that have a really decent youth justice system, like New Zealand is known around the world for, for good principle youth justice. Um, but, you know, once a child commits a murder or manslaughter, we completely exclude that child or young person from the system. And that really is a theme around the world. Um, and that idea of imprisonment being the default punishment um, or form of accountability. And so when we've seen reforms, it's been more about mitigating imprisonment by having children in detention, child specific detention, or 
you know, mitigating the sentence in terms of having a cap, but no real imagining of what we could actually do in response to these cases without resorting to imprisonment. Um, so I suppose in terms of where we saw the future state or how would we actually get to a really principled approach, um, we really saw that those twin lenses of the brain development neuroscience and, and the human rights framework can work together really well. And so that idea that having a scientific basis, which does really resonate with some parts of the public, because, you know, let's again be realistic here that we need the public and political buy-in to affect change. Um, the idea that increasing incorporation of the convention does show real um, results in terms of uh, reform for children. Um, and the idea that we need evaluation and research of these alternatives and um, so that we can definitively say that uh, reintegration and public safety is best served by these type of responses. Um, excuse me. So I suppose in closing, that idea um, that, yeah, we do have to involve the public and we do have to involve um, politicians because that's the only way that we're going to affect real change. And so I suppose going back to my um, example at the start of you know, when we are in front of those politicians and those decision makers, we need to be able to really clearly say what a, an age appropriate accountability looks like, because I think we've really, really made the case that life imprisonment, the juvenile death penalty, these sentences of imprisonment are inhumane and wrong. Um, but when there is a murder or a manslaughter or a really serious event, we do need some kind of response and we need to be able to really clearly say what an age appropriate and children's rights compliant approach looks like. All right, I'll leave it there and um, hand over to Ursula, I think, next. Thank you very much. Um, so last, but by no means least, we have Professor Ursula Kelly, who is Professor at University College Cork in Ireland. Um, Professor Kilkelly publishes and researches in children's rights um, and in youth justice widely and on a wide variety of issues. Um, she is also co-editor of Youth Justice, an international journal, um, and has been chairperson of the Board of Management of Oberstown Children, Oberstown Children Detention Campus, which is Ireland's national detention campus since 2016. And in that role, um, she has done a huge amount of work in overseeing the implementation of a rights-based approach um, to the treatment of children in detention. Um, and this, some of this work is now reflected in um, her new book, um, Advancing Children's Rights in Detention, a Model for International Reform, which was published by Bristol University Press in 2022. So her presentation um, today is going to pick up on, on some of these themes and challenges um, and is entitled Implementing Children's Rights in Detention, Opportunities and Challenges. Thanks, uh, Louise. And hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that have been raised um, by, by all of our speakers really in taking on um, the specific instance of children's rights in detention and examining and, and outlining some of the lessons that we've learned from this process uh, in Ireland over the last uh, 10 years or so. And it really is sort of reflecting um, the um, the international children's rights standards as a, as a set of international um, benchmarks, um, recognizing their importance, uh, the importance of their legal standing, the convention, the general comments, um, other um, other instruments um, adopted either by the, the UN or by the Council of Europe, um, and, um, and and looking, I suppose, to those uh, international instruments as a really detailed map and maybe web at times of how you might um, take children's rights and apply them in the context of detention. Um, I mean, it's a bit of an, an, an anomaly in a way to even be talking about children's rights in detention. The, the abuses and the breaches of rights in detention are widespread and there's a huge amount um, of, of research um, and of policy work that has documented how poorly children are treated in detention and uh, no, um, no more important than the UN Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty, which was published in 2019, which Anne, um, of course, had, had a leading role. Um, that, that makes it very clear that we have a very serious uh, set of problems on our hands, but we don't have a huge amount of documented 
research on how that situation can be ameliorated, improved, um, and, and changed with regard to guaranteeing a rights-based approach in detention. Um, and as I said, for some, that, that is um, a contradiction in terms, um, but we have to, I think, accept that the convention does not prohibit detention. It permits detention, albeit as a last resort and for the shortest appropriate period of time. But even still, it permits um, very long sentences in, in, um, in, uh, in technically um, permits detention uh, for life, as long as there's a possibility of parole. And while we can argue about a holistic interpretation of that um, provision, that is what the convention currently says and what the states had in mind when they adopted it back in 1989. So where does that leave us with regard to uh, both the conditions of detention and the use of detention? Well, there are still very clear parameters set down um, in the convention about um, the right of the child to um, enjoy the substantive rights to health, education, right to family contact, right to protection from harm, and so on. Um, and, and also, obviously, as I mentioned, the, the principle of detention as a last resort. Um, it, it's still, and I think it was clear from, from Nessa and Yannick's um, presentation as well, we still run out of ideas pretty quickly when it comes to the challenge of, of making those principles, giving those principles a really direct um, effect in, in, uh, in children's lives day to day. And I suppose that's the, what I want to talk through really briefly was what we've learned as, as important markers for a process that it enables that to take place. Um, in uh, we Ireland ratified the convention uh, right back at the beginning, and in 2001, not long afterwards, um, we um, uh, 21 years ago now we adopted um, a very comprehensive piece of legislation uh, looking to reform our youth justice law, and we incorporated um, a number of principles from the convention into that law, specifically the principle of detention as a last resort, but also crucially setting down an expectation of individualized um, rights-based care and education for children in detention. So from a very early stage, uh, we had committed to um, a particular model of detention um, that would be an exceptional measure, uh, really reserved for those um, serious cases and um, for a detention that would offer um, a recognition of children's complex needs and, and a, a multidisciplinary um, individualized um, um, system for identifying children's needs and ensuring that those needs were met, um, including um, both with regard to their care in detention, their contact with family, and crucially, their preparation for release. Um, and, and that was directly linked back to the convention's emphasis on reintegration and, and rehabilitation and seeing detention not as a point in time on its own, but actually part of a continuum in a child's life and in the child's engagement with the youth justice system. When, what Ireland did after that was it enacted several sequential policy uh, documents, which tried to put um, flesh on the bones of what that outline objective sought to achieve. So it made provision, for instance, of capital for capital expenditure for a new facility. Uh, it, it identified um, a whole range of measures that needs to be in place to um, create an environment within the detention uh, facility for um, individualized child-centered care. Um, and it worked as with through the, the detail of the staffing and the other um, might be seen as ancillary areas of support that would be required. So the integrated model of care, multidisciplinary um, and multi-professional services. Um, and, um, and as I said, um, that process of reform structured through policy continued the theme, if you like, of children's rights standards from the international international law and then down into policy. So setting very clear expectations for what um, we were required to deliver in the national approach to the care of children in detention. Um, I think um, sk skipping on a little bit, um, what was important subsequently um, and as part of that process was then the 
taking of the children's rights standards into the um, national detention center policy base. So we developed, and Louise was part of this project, um, of, of looking uh, forensically at all the international instruments and standards um, and looking at the national expectations and national uh, rules as well, and created what's called the Children's Rights Policy Framework, which is a commitment to a set of rules um, which identify the rights to which children are entitled in detention, and then through an individual policy in each area, articulate what those mean uh, in, in the child's day-to-day -day experience, and then um, also identifying the obligations um, on, on staff and on management and on the governance bodies to, um, to ensure that those rights are given full effect. So now we have at a detention centre level, and we have, only, we have a single centre, so it's the national approach, um, a rights-based um, uh, policy framework that articulates children's rights in the day-to-day -day experience. And that was uh, developed also with children and young people themselves as well as engaging with consulting with staff and other stakeholders as part of that process. Um, and that gave us um, a, a, you know, a further, I suppose, expanded view of what the rights would look like uh, when they were experienced by children day to day, um, not just, for example, those that were maybe given priority in, in the convention or in our legislation around care and education, but those matters that are really critical to children's rights approaches, in particular, uh, the right of, the, of children to have a say in decisions made about them, something that's always crucially important to young people themselves, um, and other areas too, like partnership with families, which came out very strongly from the consultation with children, um, perhaps is not as strong in, in the convention or in our law. So we were able to round out the policy framework with regard to the views and, and priorities of children themselves as we did that. Um, we then um, went through a process of developing procedures so that staff got into their hands, the, the procedures, uh, the manual that had to be followed to, to give effect to these um, rules and policies um, and, and developed training to deliver that approach again in consultation with staff and involving young people where possible. So it's a, been a holistic end-to-end um, uh, -end process, taking the convention, um, ultimately uh, delivering it through training um, with, with staff on the ground. Um, in terms then of, of the in inspection and the accountability around all of that, we um, have a national inspector that inspects um, all children's services and um, in including the detention centre and the, uh, they're called the Health Information Quality Authority. And they developed their own inspection framework based on our policies. So now we are being inspected in an objective, rigorous manner on an annual basis against the children's rights policy framework. So we have um, our first, um, our first um, inspection report on how we're doing against children's rights standards and that that would become measured and, and measurable year on year as we go on. So giving, giving a level of assurance publicly and, and a level of accountability publicly around all that these reports are, are, um, are published annually and, um, and there's summary reports just about to be published on how we did last year. So we're setting the, our bar really high and we're being held to that bar by, in, by the national inspectors. Um, if I could just in the few minutes that I've left really highlight um, some, of the, some of the challenges that, that you experience when you look at the international standards in, in, through the prism and through, through the, the lens that we've taken. Uh, you often find insufficient granularity in the standards as they exist. Uh, and as an example, I would say um, the area, for instance, of, of what we call single separation or, or the use of, of, an, of a measure of isolation uh, as a behaviour management tool in detention. There's very little in the, in the international standards to guide you on, on what that, in certainly in technical detail, what, how, that should, um, how that should be used, um, the extent to which it should be used and so on. We, we developed our own framework around that with, informed by national policy and children's rights standards, where we, for example, ensure that it's it's individualized decision making, that there is approval and accountability, that there is review, and that there is um, um, also an important engagement with the young person as, as, an, as a part of that process. So we've had to read in to the international, um, the into our children's rights approach, the, the related international standards. 
Um, I think the other piece, and there are other areas where, where that lack of detail, lack of granularity or, or specificity is, is a challenge. Um, I think the other um, the other area um, that that comes comes up against us that that's relevant in the context of implementation is the whole issue of culture and how you address the culture of any environment like like a detention center to create um, space for the right space approach to take hold. It's not easy to um, I suppose have that dialogue with staff who might feel. Uh, that, that their rights are, are less important as a result, which of course is not the case. A safe environment is safe for everyone. Um, but it is a challenge when you're communicating a rights-based approach to, um, to staff who, who may have concerns that their, their rights, if you like, are less, less important and less worthy. So that's, um, I think, also interesting to see in the, um, in the international standards, the extent to which they um, identify the importance of choosing uh, appropriately trained and qualified and interested staff and the importance of training and accountability. So we find those international standards um, really useful in, in that context. And for us, one of the key learnings was that until the staff felt ownership of this process, it actually wasn't going to deliver the kind of rights-based care that, that we uh, had um, were, had an obligation to, to secure under the convention. Um, I think the other piece that um, just as was in general um, to, to remark is that change uh, as a process is not dealt with in the in the convention or in the international standards. Right? It's, it's almost expected that you, you know, it presents you with the final result. It doesn't really tell you how you get there. And that's part of the, the learning and the sharing of our our experience and why why we were keen to publish. Um, the book that tried to help others learn from what we've been through, which which at times was extremely challenging, and 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 it continues to be a work in progress. Nobody uh, is, is at all suggesting that this is this is anything but a an endless sort of um, continuous process of improvement and um, and implementation. But it is something where you can see measurable results based on the rights based um, uh, framework and approach that we've developed. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And thanks very much for, for your attention and for the invitation, Louise. Thank you very much um, to all three of you for those for those fascinating um, presentations. I can see some um, um, back and forth in, in the chat in relation to questions. Please do feel free to post any questions um, that you may have for, for our panelists today, and we can pick up on those. But um, to begin with, I, I think I'm going to abuse my position as chair, if you don't mind, um, and, and ask um, our panelists really to, to reflect on, because I think we can see you know, similar themes in a lot of those, um, those um, papers. So thinking about you know, this question of the degree of integration of the international standards and the convention, in national law, you spoke about how courts play a really important role, how policymakers need to deal with this, but also how, you know, on the ground, at more local level, particular sectors of, of youth justice systems are, are kind of taking up this, this challenge. I was wondering if um, any of our panelists had um, could reflect a little bit on how those um, domestic arrangements for incorporation, but also how the degree of commitment to children's rights principles at, at various sectors um, within society, you know, can help to, I suppose, embed or present opportunities about embedding these, these rights principles to bring about meaningful change. Whoever would like to go first. <laughs> Um, I suppose reflecting back on the informal chat we were having just before we started the formal session where we were talking about um, yeah, like constitutional arrangements in different countries and which is the best setting. Um, so I suppose like the area of the world that I work work in like doesn't have a huge profile in terms of the children's rights. Um, so um, it's only been really recently that the convention has been mentioned in legislation or there's been any incorporation. So um, I think it very much depends on um, the, the culture, the human rights culture in that particular jurisdiction. So we were talking about just before we began the formal part that say in some parts of the world, um, it just doesn't really enter enter the consciousness. Um, so the kind of structure, the architecture of the particular legal system, I think, is a really important one. Um, and whether like so say in Australia and New Zealand, you just don't even have a 
that culture of kind of having recourse to the European Court of Human Rights um, and there just isn't that culture of using the rights framework to advance things but but that's changing a little bit so I think it's very very different in in different jurisdictions and um, whereas when I come to Ireland I think actually there's much more of awareness even on people working on the ground as Ursula has described about that there is a convention and you need to um <laughs> you need to abide by it. I agree that the environment is important, but I guess what we have to then try to do is to think about uh, those pathways to justice um, have to be made by walking. So making pathways by walking um, means trying out things even where they aren't easy to do. Um, trying out um, to see how far we can get along those pathways and um, sometimes failing, of course, that, that might be the case. But I think it's important to, even in difficult environments, think about what, what one can do or, or you know, less, less obvious and more amenable environments um, so that we constantly make, make progress. And I think another aspect or another way of answering what Louise was asking is, you know, it's, there were all these little circles of work going on. So there were circles of policy making, and what we've just been hearing from Ursula, circles of practice, you know. And um, I think what's what's useful about it all is that the that the Convention on the Rights of the Child does kind of create um, a common language in this um, babel of activities let's say um so that hopefully we can we can work across it within our own country across disciplines um across countries to learn from other experiences and in a way our, our conversation is eased by the fact that we have a kind of google translate ability of all understanding the convention on the rights of the child i i would also add sorry Anna, can I go I, I think the other point I would make, and I, I, I you know, I was reflecting on um, two two things. One is um, the role of media and the the important role that media can play in in ensuring accountability and in setting the tone for a national debate. If your media is informed and and uh, rights in rights informed. Um, it can make a very different dynamic um, possible to one where there is a more right wing, um, uh, particularly in relation to youth justice, which can be a highly, highly politicized event, and, and particularly where you have, uh, as Nessa said in her presentation, the sort of high profile cases that are always really worrying for any society. Um, all depends on which which way you 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 take that that worry. Um, and and for us, the role of the media was really important in keeping the pressure on to reform. Um, and so that's one thing. I think the other point I'd make, just in terms of looking back and doing the research for the book, how remarkable it was to to me at the time that we. Uh, had were, were so progressive and ambitious with the legislation that was enacted in 2001, but in fact that got drafted uh, during the 1990s after we'd um, incorporated, sorry, after we'd ratified the convention and through dialogue with the committee, which was very particular about the, the recommendations in the youth justice area and the interplay between the convention and, um, and youth justice. So the international dialogue for many states, and this is true for those who've incorporated and those who haven't, the international dialogue with the committee can be highly influential, particularly for those states that really care about their international reputations. And we certainly found the leverage created by the international treaty bodies, including the committee, throughout the process of reform, really important um, in uh, keeping that, I suppose, that, that sort of touchstone of the international standard, which you're expected to meet if you are uh, a, you know, a, a democratic and, and rights-based um, society. So that those were two of the influences media and the international, I think, are really important. Yes. Well, if, if, if I um, may, um, well, from 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 a perspective of a scholar using children's rights or trying to use children's rights to inform uh, policymakers, practitioners, um, my experience is that it, it's 
sometimes hard to offer an alternative solution like Nessa mentioned. And it's not always a very strong argument uh, in very concrete matters. For example, at the moment in the Netherlands, the Ministry of Justice is considering raising the detention, maximum detention for, for children, for 16, 17 year olds from two years to four years. Uh, and this was sparked by a petition started by parents of three children who were killed by other children. Um, so it's very, we, we, we did research, um, which was commissioned by the Ministry of Justice, also from a children's rights perspective, but there's not really a very strong argument from the children's rights framework to say, no, a race to four years is a violation of children's rights. It offers some boundaries, it offers some guidance, but not, uh, it, it's not always possible to use it like that. So to me, the children's rights framework is more, serves as kind of a counterbalance against overly punitive um, responses or ideas. Uh, but sometimes also as a counterbalance to an overly, let's say, paternalistic, welfare-oriented approaches to say, okay, look, there are rights, there are standards, children are, children are rights holders, um, and to raise awareness of, among politi uh, politi uh, politicians, policymakers, practitioners. Uh, for me, that's uh, an important function of the children's rights framework, I would say. Thank you. And I mean, finally, I suppose in relation to those kind of gaps that we see in the international standards, particularly relating to those very difficult questions around responding to serious events, around the treatment of children in um, circumstances in which they're particularly vulnerable, such as such as detention. I mean, where do you see the kind of, again, the you know, the opportunities for development of that kind of common lexicon? Is it you know, through the, the monitoring process, is it through the individual com complaints mechanism, is it through advocacy and incorporation of scientific and evidence around development? Where do you think those possibilities lie? I, I would just say that the interplay between research and, and, and policy and practice is really key. Um, that understanding and focusing on implementation more in uh, where there's opportunity to to partner across across areas um, it's really valuable. I would never have had the understanding of the challenges around implementation if I hadn't been involved at a at a level of of direct sort of direct involvement um, with the the actual management of the change process. So it's huge. Um, there's a huge amount to be learned from that process for for the for the academic community. Um, we often can't get involved sufficient to understand that directly, but we can through partnership approaches and and co authorship. I think really really look to expand our own our own horizons and our own understanding of the issues um, and that sense of of um, I suppose stretching what we understand important research to mean going from the theoretical to the really, really practical and creating a space for that um, in, in scholarship, which can be difficult. Dr. Ford, maybe if uh, there are no other responses on this unit, I would like to pose a question about the relationship between international law and domestic law, because we heard very important presentation on this. Uh, all the speakers spoke, hinted on this. For example, Dr. Linz, Dr. Van der Big spoke about also the comparative aspects. My questions are to Professor Skelton and to Professor Kilkelly. To Professor Skelton, the question is, Professor Skelton, you spoke about the indirect effect, how the South African paradigm tries to indirectly incorporate international law in the national jurisdiction. My question is, is there a hindrance in this regarding the legitimacy of international law? Maybe this whole endeavor is going to backfire, and whether this is an exception, the South African example. And to Professor Kilkelly, my question is you, I think very importantly, mentioned also the role of the Council of Europe. So what is the role of the Council of Europe when it comes to children international law? Because we spoke about the UN and the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And thanks in advance for the answers. Yes, I, I get your point. I suppose, it, you know, obviously a more formal type of incorporation is safer, no doubt about it. But something that's interesting is that having to have the conversations about incorporation um, or to make the case in court and persuade a court and have it get into the judgment somehow raises the level of awareness of the, of the convention and 
And um, Ursula actually writes about this in relation to Ireland, where she says that, you know, although in the end, what, what got into the Irish constitution was a bit weak and disappointing, but the conversations that had to be had to get to that point were really important about raising the level of awareness on children's rights. And somehow in countries where it's an automatic thing, you may find that none of the judges in the country are very interested in it or aware of it and don't incorporate it into their judgments because it's just there and it's a given. But, but what does that really mean? Um, and what I, 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 but I mean, the, the full incorporation definitely gets people asking those questions because here in Scotland, people are asking those questions now. So when you incorporate separately, you have to, you have to think about what that means. Whether you do that directly, all at once, incrementally, through your constitution or through your, your legal frameworks, there do seem to be some discursive advantages to having those conversations. Um, but if you want to look at it from a purely legal, legal point of view, there is, there is the risk that future governments might, you know, future courts, future, I mean, we all like to think that you know, Supreme Courts stick to their uh, their own precedents, but I think we're all learning that that, that may be at risk. So, you know, I, I guess that's that's true. Having it as a law could be important. I agree. Yeah, thanks. And I, and I think just on that as well, the other the other really important player in all of this are our national bodies in in taking the international to to the national. And whether you're talking about the Centre for Child Law in, in Pretoria or are you talking about the the, the children's commissioners? Um, they they it's really critical to have uh, national bodies that act sometimes as the bridge between international and national law, and that's certainly something that that we research that we're doing on on independent children's rights institutions is sort of showing really clearly. Um, I think that I think the the, um, the Council of Europe um, standards were for us equally important, in particular, the UN rules, uh, sorry, the, the Council of Europe rules for um, on juvenile subjects to sanctions and measures um, was really complementary to the Havana rules when we started looking at the detailed day-to-day -day experience of children's rights in detention, really, really useful. Um, obviously, the guidelines on child-friendly justice have, have created a new emphasis really on, on children in the justice process, which has been really critical. And then the other piece I would say is in relation to um, the, the institutions of the Council of Europe, not just the court, of course, but, but also the Commissioner for Human Rights, who made a number of uh, visits during a critical time for us. Thomas Hammerberg had a particular interest in, in, in juvenile justice, but, but subsequent commissioners equally have shown um, really strong interest in what's going on in youth justice. And, and, and equally, and I did some research in, um, on this in a good 10 years ago now, I think, but, but on the Committee for the Prevention of Torture, looking at the capacity of the CPT to um, promote greater and higher standards of treatment um, for the rights of children in detention um, right across the board. And um, there's real capacity in the CPT to, to uh, given, given how frequently they see and visit um, places of detention and can engage with children directly. It's a really important mechanism. And interestingly, um, we found this was the CPT was the only body that of, of all of those who commented and observed and monitored what we were doing that said we needed to be careful not to move too fast. Everybody else said you need to move faster. You need, to, you need to get the prison closed to move the 16 and 17 year olds out of adult prison. Um, and the CPT was the only body that said, you need to be careful not to move too fast. This is huge change. You need to bring people with you and you need to do it safely. So that was um, a, a bit of a cheer for the Council of Europe, I think. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of, of time. Um, so I think if there are no more um, questions, it may be time to, to thank all of our speakers for um, these really, really fascinating insights into these really important areas around how these children's rights standards can bring about change within the justice system. Um, and to thank you for your time so long. So my part also to thank everybody for the participation, to remind the audience that the video of the event is going to be uploaded to the Brunel Law School YouTube channel. 
And we look forward to seeing you next year with more events. And we thank you once again for your support for the BUL International Law Group you have shown throughout the year. Thank you very much and a nice summer to everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.